oil still oil still moves higher? Yeah, because I mean, I'll take China as an example. There's this, and I pointed this out a couple of times in different things I've been doing. But there's this strange anomaly that's happening right now in China, where car sales um, are actually, you know, doing very well. We've seen some of the latest numbers in Shanghai and elsewhere. But at the same time, oil consumption is actually, you know, not responding. At least not responding in in a sort of linear or co- highly correlated fashion with the increase in auto sales. So the question you ask yourself is, is, are people just buying cars to sort of keep as museum pieces? Because it's clear from the data that they're not driving them. Um, or at least not driving them as much as you would expect. And, of course, what's happening is, is this is a function of the stimulus um, in China, and so you're seeing a lot of it going into capital assets. And I think what's going to happen in 2010 is you can see a lot of these capital assets get put into use, which even if the amount of stimulus declines, picking on China in particular, you're still going to see consumption trend higher than you would expect given economic growth. I like that. That's uh, that's probably one of the best answers I've heard on where oil is going uh, in, in, a, in a while, actually. I read on your blog, you had a really great post on your blog recently about tail risk, which I understood to mean uh, potential fringe risk scenarios that aren't so fringe. Uh, give me a couple of the ones that you are, I don't want to say concerned about, the, but the ones that you definitely want to watch most carefully, a couple of your favorite tail risk, let's call it. Sure. So, you know, as you say, I sort of went through a, a, a fairly extensive list of some of the things that people need to be most concerned about, and we've touched on a bunch of them right now. You know, sort of the, super, the, the, the renewed super spike in oil, the sort of sovereign crisis around the dollar, um, it, with respect to its this, this transition that the U.S. financing structure is going from from being relatively skewed long term to relatively skewed shorter term in terms of the total liabilities of of, uh, of, of the. Of the of, of the debt structure of the United States right now. So, you know, these are these are all sort of potential tail risks that I, that I worry about, but there's there's lots more. I mean, you can obviously, I think you need to be concerned about the sort of heads up we've gotten from H1N1 over the last year. That's not because specifically H1N1 is going to turn into something, you know, dire and catastrophic, but it showed how well prepared we are for responding to any kind of a, you know, a natural or even artificial biowarfare type uh, introduction of a biologic into the into the global economies is, you know, we've completely fumbled this. I mean, despite having, what, 12 months, 6 to 12 months right. of preparatory time, look at what's happened in Canada, look what's happened in the U.S. If this had actually been a serious situation, it would have been catastrophic. And yet uh, this was this was with ample warning and without hordes of people, um, you know, dying all around the planet. And so these are some of the examples of tail risks that I worry about. The other one that I worry about a great deal um, and talk about a lot, we saw an early an early example of it just this past week was the in the Dubai scenario right. is sovereign risk. And, you know, there are a host of sovereigns. Dubai is, frankly, you know, a flea on an elephant's ass from the standpoint of the consequences for the global financial system. It's a nice story and a great comeuppance, but... You know, there are many other uh, countries that are in, you know, equally or even more pro- problematic positions, not least of which, and I'm sad to say, is Greece, <laughs> as the present company obviously included. Um, but so is Ukraine, Latvia, uh, Russia in some ways. Um, I mean, there's a, a long list of, of countries that if, if we get to the point where there is the global pot for funding so much of what's happening at the sovereign level among the developed countries begins to feel squeezed, the people who will be squeezed out first won't be the U.S., it won't be Japan. It's going to be the people at the other end of the funding pipe who are never exactly the sorts of, the, the sorts of highly liquid and secure uh, recipients of capital that people actually wanted to, you know, felt comfortable about during the crisis in the first place. And they will all be en masse and in synchronous, in, in synchronous form, starved of capital, and will see serial defaults across Eastern Europe and, uh, uh, you know, at, probably at the worst possible time. And so these are all the sorts of tail risks that I think investors need to watch very closely. And, you know, in Dubai, you know, while it got played that way, really wasn't that kind. It was a very different thing that was going on there, um, a very conscious decision on the part of the rulers. And what we need to watch for instead are the sort of serial cascading defaults that are likely to happen or could potentially happen in, you know, so let's say Spain, Germany, Latvia, Ukraine, and even potentially Russia, you know, in a, in a truly worst-case scenario. And, and, but these are all examples of tail risks. Did it surprise you uh, that there was such fast movement to the U.S. dollar, gold dropped 60 bucks, it was almost all instantaneous? Did that surprise you, or did, did it at least give you comfort in the fact that, you know, maybe the U.S. dollar still is, uh, you know, really still has that that uh, currency of last resort strength and maybe hasn't lost its luster. It's easy to beat up for a long time, but as soon as the first sign of potential problem came, everyone rushed to the U.S. dollar. How that? Uh, how should we interpret that? 
So I see that very much as a function of liquidity, that crisis breeds an incredible lust for liquidity, and liquidity is, is, is this kind of mysterious thing that sort of you know runs in pools and pockets and, and, and hides in closets. But one of the best places and probably the foremost place to find in the world is in uh, treasury markets and the dollar. So as perverse as it seemed to many people, and I, and I know many of my, you know, my compatriots were just, you know, floored by what happened, it, we shouldn't be surprised that this, this flight to safety is not so much a flight to the dollar as a flight to liquidity. And so until there is something with comparable, a market with comparable depth and liquidity, in a crisis you are always going to see people flee to the most liquid instruments because they want security. And right now that's the dollar, so it, it shouldn't have been altogether surprising. I'm going to ask you one last question, kind of my uh, maybe fringe or tail, or, or tail risk, if you want to call it that. Is, uh, has the fiat paper money system failed? Any chance that we're going back to gold, as a, a, you know, tying ourselves to the, to the gold standard? So I, uh, so I think it's a great question, and it's something I puzzle over all the time. You know, people who are advocates for the you know, returning to a gold-backed system, in many ways, I think, uh, you know, haven't thought through their history, at least if they, if they paid attention to some of the, the, the limitations that system had, we'd have a more nuanced discussion. That's not to say that going back isn't a bad idea. It's just they both have, you know, some fairly important limitations, fiat-based and gold-backed. But uh, my, my point now is I think there's no – I don't see how, at least in some countries, at least for some period of time, we're not going to see a system where we go back to uh, being – at least partially backed by gold. And we're seeing a little bit of that now with some sovereigns, you know, the Indian example most recently, and we're seeing other rumblings about others buying chunks of IMF gold. Uh, other countries trying to do the same thing and at least create a tacit, if not an explicit link back to gold so that it looks like the, sort of the ratio of the money, the money supply, to, you know, value of gold held in reserve looks more, looks more tenable because there is a natural suspicion that having seen how people respond to a financial crisis by, you know, turning on the printing presses and letting them, letting them howl, that it really drove home how, not just how fragile, but in many ways how valueless uh, fiat paper currency systems can be when you need them most. Yeah, and, that's, and that is the big question that's been going through my mind as well. Uh, you know, how long can the U.S. keep printing, uh, keep, keep printing and using the printing presses? And you're right, you brought up good points out. The world needs the U.S. at a certain point, but where does that tipping point come or where does that... Uh, you know, well, we're... right, and that's been the whole debate about, you know, there's some wonderful books and articles out there, Reinhardt and Rogoff, this time it's different, is, uh, you know, one I highly recommend to people, um, which looks at this question of over the last 300 years of, some, you know, pre-modern and modern financial markets, what have been the tipping points in terms of uh, countries uh, that have built up massive amounts of debt and have approached the kinds of levels we're talking about now and then undergone some kind of financial crisis. And, you know, there's lots of things we can put a point to, but unfortunately, you know, this isn't, this isn't physics, so there's no linear relationship mm -hmm. and there's no mathematical predictive value. We know at some level it's too high and at some level you get away with it for longer than you think. And the trouble for the, the, the U.S. market is, is that, uh, the U.S. dollar is that as the reserve currency with this sort of, you know, last vestige of liquidity problem, or I suppose advantage to many investors, my worry is that we will, because it doesn't happen at 100% of GDP or 200% of GDP or 300% of GDP, we'll think that somehow the U.S. is different. And all that means is that when the end comes and the, and the thing breaks, the break will be that much, that much more catastrophic and awful. So, you know, we should never convince ourselves that just because there's something unique that's allowed that this, this, this thing that can't go on to go on longer than we think, that that means it can go on forever because it won't. Well, and on that note, I'm going to encourage everyone who's listening in, if you don't do so already, ready uh, to get it yourself over to Paul's blog, because I'm hoping, Paul, that when that tipping point does come, you'll be able to identify it maybe just a little bit faster than the rest of us and maybe give us a heads up on your blog at some point. Uh, your, your blog address, I mean, I've got a bookmark, paul.kodrosky.com. I've got a bookmark, so I don't even remember. Yeah, it's just kodrosky.com. That, that takes you to the place. Yeah, and there's a link to, uh, and there's a link to Paul's blog uh, from, this, from this presentation. Paul, I could go on for another half hour because this, this time has flown right by. So first of all, I want to I wanna thank you for taking time out of your day. Obviously, from reading your accomplishments and, and the things you do, uh, you've got a busier schedule than anybody. So on behalf of everyone at Agoracom, uh, deep appreciation. Much thanks for, for taking time to talk to everybody. I'm going to leave the last word to you. Anything that we haven't covered or anything that in, uh, or the last takeaway point that you want to emphasize for people out there? Um, the only thing I would suggest to people is that, is, and this is sort of one of my rules of the road as I look at what's happening out there, is there's this kind of naive, I call it naive contrarianism. So people will say, 
everyone loves gold, so I need to be short gold. Everyone's bear, bullish on or bearish on the U.S., so I should be bullish on the U.S. And th- that kind of naive contrarianism is, is, is very easy, very obvious, and very dangerous, and in particular at sort of giant inflection points like right now. So I would encourage people to always be watching for, because it's the way I think about the world, you know, sort of appropriate contrarianism, that's great to run against the herd, but then this naive contrarianism where long before things have played themselves out, people are going to try and talk you into reversing your positions and you shouldn't. You've been listening to Paul Kudrowski at the Agorcom Online Gold and Commodities Conference. Paul, thank you again for joining us. Uh, everyone, you'll see the links to Paul's blog and other information, his Twitter account uh, right here on the slide that, uh, that hosts this presentation. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it, and we're looking back and we're looking forward to your feedback on the blog. Thanks, George.